Hello, my name is Jamie Lindau, and I'm the sales manager of Trocky Building Systems. Today, we're going to be doing this uh, informational video on what are typical mistakes in self-storage development. What you see behind me is a truck ready to go out. Your building is ordered, and it's going to be delivered today. The real truth is, most likely you've already made, before the building even gets there, you have made a whole number of mistakes with the building and the site layout that um, you, know, you might not even realize. So what we're gonna do is backtrack from this point and look at some of the items you have to look at before you actually order your building and get it to make sure you don't have problems and mitigate some of your problems with your facility before you begin. Well, the absolute most important aspect of your entire facility is your site location. And when you're trying to determine your location, these are the mistakes that I typically see. First of all, you look at a parcel like this. This one is for sale. One of the things is how large is the site that you have? This one is a fairly small one. It's only two acres. And with only two acres, you can only get a drive up units 30,000 square feet, for example. That's really not enough to have a office. You would have to do it remotely. A lot of people, what they regret is that they don't get enough land. And so, you know, some sites get thrown out right away because they're not large enough. The other thing you have to ver is verify that you have the correct zoning, the absolute most important, because will the city let you build it here? This location right here is on a minor road and right behind, in front of me is a major road that bisects an interstate. Freaking perfect, except that, you know, you gotta make sure that a, the city will allow you to build it here. So you gotta check zoning and then the site size to make sure you can phase it large enough to make your project big enough to handle it. If you're gonna do it remotely, you can have a small site. If you want an office, a manager, you're gonna need three or four acres unless you go multi-story, then you can do a couple acres. And uh, then you look at phasing the property. So the site location, by far, because the thing that you're gonna find out, building a mini storage is roughly the same price across the country. What you get as far as your rental rates are and uh, you know, how fast you rent up is all based on your location. So that's the number one key. As we're still on the topic of your land that you're looking to develop, you know, the self-storage behind me, it's not just where the buildings lie and where your driveways are gonna be. There's gonna be a whole portion of your land that you're not gonna be able to use because it's gonna be your retention detention pond. Because what happens is you have to have all the water stay at your property. Now, if you look at this site behind me, you didn't realize that he had to have this massive retention pond to hold all the water. And that takes up a huge amount of space, could take up to an acre of land. So you have to take that into account when you're figuring out the size. And the thing, another mistake people do is they will lay out their entire property without figuring out where this location of the retention pond is. So that's why getting your site engineer involved right away, determine how large a pond you need and where its location would be, then you work on your site layout to make sure it is correct. And then how do we drain into it? How do we uh, mitigate any water problems? That's one of the critical mistakes people have that you can't fix later. You'll look to buy a property, you wonder why it's being sold. A lot of times because it has water problems. So one of the very important keys to a successful self-storage. We've talked a little bit about the land, and I'm a huge fan of phasing the project. Not building too much at one time. If you did do anything, a lot of times you put more foundations in ahead and don't build all the buildings at one time because then you can change your unit mix and then you have all the excavation and everything done. But if you do are able to buy a very large parcel, it might behoove you or a good idea to have the whole site graded at the first time or at least the majority of it so that you have a lot of room to do some, have outside parking and RV storage. Now, 
This, what you're seeing over here, you can make some income on it. There is typically not enough of this out there in the, in the world. You don't make as much money as what you do with the regular building, but boy, it's helping to offset um, you know, the cost of the land and everything. So now, there used to be RVs parked here, but we moved them out because right here is where the next building is gonna go. So then you're able to adjust the unit mix for example, this building here is going to have a lot more 5x10s. I really didn't believe I would need them in uh, a smaller town, but they are renting because of all the apartments built in town. So I was even surprised. But uh, you need to have a spot, and it's going to be very easy to put the foundation in. And uh, the only reason I'm not putting another one is because I don't want to lose any of the RV spaces because they're already rented. So. Phasing is great to adjust your Unimix to what people want. And uh, also, you protect yourself because I'm already up to the level. I'm paying for the project and uh, it's a more conservative approach. One of the other minor things that happens periodically with people doing site layouts is that they'll make a dead end driveway. We're seeing a small example of it here where you drive in, but how is somebody going to get out? You're expecting them to back out. Well, the problem is that they will try to turn around because we don't, know, we don't know how to back up anymore. And so they will try to turn around. If they do, they'll probably damage your building. So this is one thing you try to avoid if you can with your layout. When you lay out your site, the thing is you have to figure out where a gate's going to be. And many times, you're building a small spite, you aren't even going to put a gate in. But it doesn't really matter. Whether you're going to put a gate in now or later, you should figure it out. Because this example right behind me is somebody that decided to add a gate later. Now, what, they, what is done well is that from the keypad to the gate is about 20 feet. That's good. You want it over 15 feet. So it has time to open. But it's weird how you have some of the units outside the gate and some of the units inside the gate. That doesn't uh, work, you know, that's not a normal situation. But here is they had to make some adjustments. So you always want to plan your gate right up front to make sure you get it properly positioned. Now we're at an example of a different site that one of the things you look at is they have plenty of distance for your vehicle to get off the road before they get to the keypad. And th because this had such a large front setback, it really wasn't a problem. Now, the other thing you have with your keypad is that you have bollards protecting it so people don't run into it. And if you'll notice, the bollards stick out just a little bit of front of the actual keypad. And because there's access a little bit behind me, put a bollard in the back so somebody doesn't actually turn around here or something and hit the bollard. The other thing with the gates, People have asked me what size gate do you need, you know, what other accessories you might want. One of the things I do like to have is a separate access gate where you can physically walk through. You can lock it if you need to. Now, again here, you protect it, okay, this gate. Now, this gate is 20 feet wide. That's typically the widest you do. Some people have done a 24, but I like 20 feet. But a lot of people use a 16-foot gate. And uh, I, uh, this one is 20 because there's a lot of RVs here. So they have to um, make sure that there's plenty of swing distance in here. And so the key, though, that you're looking at right here is that I can go into the office without going through the gate. That's a major mistake if you do it so that when new people come, they rent from the office, go well, there before they go through the gate. And uh, that's a big no-no if, uh, if you put the gate outside the office. Hi, I'm at a facility that was built 27 years ago. And 27 years ago, we didn't worry so much about where the water was draining. Everybody always did gable buildings. But these buildings are orientated going east and west. And when you have a building going east and west, here is the south side of the property or the building. Now you get plenty of sun, you'll melt the snow and ice, very good. 
But as I go into the shade here, this is now the north side of the property. It is late October and winter is coming. And when winter comes, snow is going to fall, water is going to drip off this roof, and you're going to have a bunch of ice here on the whole north side of the property. You can also see that there was mold growing because it never gets sun. So you try to mitigate water coming on the north side of the property. So if we would be building this one today, I would have them all lean to to the south. No water draining on the north. It also saves your pavement so you don't have any dripping on it. So that is one of the big things, your building orientation to make sure you mitigate those problems. The other thing this building has is a number of step downs because it falls towards the uh, front of the property. And a trick we're doing today is putting them on a 1% slope. This is a 150 foot long building and we could have dropped a foot and a half. And you have two one foot steps. I bet you I could have redone this site so you had no step downs. And look at the pro, you would have mitigated these things and it would have been so much easier to snow plow. So those are two things we would have done differently today to make your project less problems, less maintenance, and a better product overall. And you have to figure that out in the beginning while you're doing your development process. Behind me is a lean-to building where the water and there is a downspout, is draining to the west. Now the west gets plenty of sun later in the day like it is today. And uh, the east won't have any water draining on it. As you look to this building over here, you will see they have a high rake trim to make it look closed off, but there's no water draining here, you're not gonna have a problem. The other thing, uh, people talk to me a lot about, should I use asphalt or concrete drive? Um, asphalt drive is the norm in our industry. It uh, is good in the winter time because it absorbs sun and melts ice and it is le less expensive. But for maintenance issues, you know, concrete is, is longer lasting and uh, that's what I'm doing on this particular site, but it is not the norm. Normally it is asphalt. But typically when you go for your approvals, they're going to not let you have it gravel. They normally make you pave it uh, one way or the other. A mistake that you will see on a large number of self-storage facilities is that the foundation wasn't poured exactly perfect. And you will have this metal building going past the concrete. Now, Trakti, we add one or more inch on both sides, and what you love to have is this situation where the building is recessed from the concrete or a driveway. Normally, I do not like to see it flat, where there is no step down whatsoever. This is about an inch and a half. That is pretty much the minimum you would have. Some people like two and a half inches because it helps as a barrier for ice that it doesn't get into the unit but uh, you wouldn't want it flush if you can help it. Hi, this 27-year-old project that I'm standing on, they put corner posts in when they originally built. These are six-inch posts, four feet high, four feet in the ground. Notice this trim? This is the same trim we supplied 27 years ago. They never had to fix it. Why? Because they put the corner posts in. Okay, by preventative, doing it all four corners, you mitigate your problems in the future. So this is one of the things you have to do to protect your buildings. Okay, right now I'm at a 20 year old facility built in 1999. And uh, this facility did not put any corner posts on it. Okay, I'm just on one of the corners. Every single corner has been hit. The jam is busted, they busted the rake tram, they busted everything. What you need to do is have a corner post down here and have them crush their car, not your building. When you have exterior lights on your building, one of the main things you want to do is hide the conduit. What I cannot stand is they have the conduit exposed. There's absolutely no reason to do this. You should have it all on the inside of the building. 
One of the major regrets people have when their site is successful is that they wish they would have bought a, built a better office. So one of my opinions is if you can't build the office you really want right away, don't build any at all. Leave the space open till you get enough money then to build the correct office. The other times that people kind of make too small of an office and so um, and they regret it later and then it's so hard to change. So behind me here's an office that's accomplishing multiple things um, where the person is having it so it can be remotely run because there's a kiosk in it. It looks impressive that people can be here but that isn't always uh, manned and uh, you want that good view from the street and make sure everybody understands that you are a self-storage facility. One of the things people regret is they don't leave a vestibule in here to have your kiosk. I'm a fan of kiosks and I like that it is in a climate controlled environment. This door is open 24 hours a day and the people can use it. I haven't had many issues with the kiosk because it's in a heated and cooled environment. And uh, you know, American society is getting so used to doing them things themselves. So I, I think it's a part of the future. And then when you have your office, you just go through the next door to come into your office. And if you've looked at some of my other videos, I've always liked cameras because I believe cameras are real security for your site. That here I'm phasing the site, but I'm actually putting three TVs on because later in the phase, I'm going to add even more televisions, but I mean, more cameras, so I have the television already set up in it. And uh, one of the things that I like, you'll see a lot, is that you do your business standing up, that you have people stand up to rent your units. So, there's many different uh, looks and whatever your personal tastes are, but uh, if you make it nice, uh, that's the expectation today in our self storage facilities. One of the things that I really like is that the climate control section is connected to the office. And you have a window so you can see down the hallway if there's any problems. And there's a bunch of other little items that you like to have in your office that people wish you know, they would do a little differently. The bathroom, which I already mentioned, and then here's a little breakfast nook kind of hidden. Some people put offices in. But a lot of times for our owner managers that we have, where people are running the business themselves, they wish they'd have their own man cave, I call it, or their own operational room. And what the key is, is if you can uh, have it heated, you're going to use it. And you might do something special like a 20-foot wide bay, something you don't normally do with a self-storage because it's for me. And uh, I like to have you know, a couple sinks, water, to be able to do whatever I'm going to do. I have no idea in my retirement, but this is what I'll be playing around in. So I don't classify this as a mistake, but figure out what type of office you'll use and don't cheat the space just for one more unit because later on if the site's big enough you'll kind of regret it. You wish you would have gave up that unit just to have more room for yourself. Just something to think about. Well I know you're all looking to get into the self-storage industry and reading articles, looking at videos to figure out what you should and shouldn't do and I hope I've given you some guidance on it. But in my 35 plus years in this industry, I see the same things people say. One, I wish I would have got into it sooner. Two, I wish I would have bought more land. And three, I wish I would have made my gate, office, front entrance better. And uh, so if you got those, you're at least ahead of the game. Now when you do develop, you'll always make a mistake. I do every time. You try to minimize them to the best you can to make a good project. There's a lot of good resources out there with feasibility people, um, the Inside Self Storage Association, their trade shows, where a lot of people want you to be successful because everyone wants everyone else to be successful. You do not want somebody to build a bad facility because then they're going to do what none of us like, discount the price. 
We want you to be successful and not just the lowest price guy in town. That's not how we're, the whole industry is going. So I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I wish you good luck in all your self-storage endeavors.